Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today. So we were due to have three speakers, but just two today. And uh, Regina sends her apologies, unfortunately, she's sick today. So delighted to welcome Orla uh, and Deirdre. So I'll just give you a quick, quick introduction and, uh, and then I'll hand over if that's all right. Um, so Dr. Orla McCormack, who many of you know, is a senior lecturer in education at the School of Education. Her main teaching interests relate to curriculum policy and reform, which she teaches at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. Her research interests focus on curriculum and pre-service teacher education, particularly reflective practice. And Orla is a co-PI on the Potter project, which we're going to hear about today. And we've also got Dr. Deirdre O'Neill here, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Education. Her research interests focus on transition in teacher education, physics teacher education, and education outside the classroom. So both of our speakers are based here at the School of Education and are involved in the assessment and evaluation of Otter, which is a Horizon 2020 project that aims to enhance the understanding of education outside the classroom. So the title of today's talk is Exploring the Otter Project, Learning Science Outside the Classroom for a Better Future. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs> okay, thanks Elaine and thanks for the invite um, to talk today and also thanks to Lynn for all the organising. Um, so as Elaine said, this is a Horizon 2020 project. It's, um, it's a three year project and scarily we're two and a half um, years <clears throat> and there's the three of us involved in it and Deirdre is the world's best um, postdoc. Um, who, so Deirdre is the one that's doing all the work on the project, um, so if I look to her a lot, that's, that's why myself and Regina are there very much supporting and being in awe of, of Deirdre. Um, yeah, so what we want to do is kind of introduce you to education outside the classroom, introduce you specifically to the Otter project. Deirdre worked very closely with our schools and we're going to spend a good bit of the time looking at what the schools actually did. We have images and videos from the schools and all of them are shared with the consent of the parents, the students and, um, and the teachers. Um, if there's any questions throughout, ask. We'll try and keep it within half an hour and then open it up for questions um, as well. Um, yeah, so we look, introduce you briefly to education outside the classroom, look specifically at Otter, look at the school case study, look at impact, um, and that's still a, a piece of ongoing work, but we look at some tentative impacts and reflections and then some questions. So I suppose if you look and you, you type in education outside the classroom, you can probably get a lot of different language and, and words to describe it. So it could be informal learning, it could be outdoor learning. In Finland they use a lot of forest schools for example. But ultimately as the, the name EOC or education outside the classroom um, represents, it's basically learning that happens when the children leave the classroom and go somewhere else. Where that somewhere else might be can vary, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. What we have on the slide is what the, the project uses as the definition. I'd probably critique that a little bit, but um, we see that EOC practices are usually hands-on student experiences that take place, I think it should be outside of the classroom rather than out of the school, um, and keep students healthy both physically and mentally. And then there are a lot of different definitions about what EOC is. A lot of the time those would focus on the, the, the pedagogical approach, so it's an approach to teaching and learning. But then there are others as well that maybe would be a little bit more philosophical in their thinking or maybe trying to, to change the way that we school. So it would be trying to, to change our approach to schooling, what we think schooling is and what we think education um, is. So again, for example, in Finland, and they're one of our partner countries, a lot of the time schools there would be built near forests. And it would be intentionally built near forests so that the students could go out into the forest throughout the school day. And that's viewed as a core and central part to teaching and learning and, and schooling. 
And I suppose we know that curriculum is contextually shaped, so it's influenced and informed by the context in which it exists. So we know with education outside the classroom that some contexts are maybe more suitable and open to it than, than others. So for geographical reasons, it might be easier in some contexts over others. For social, economic and cultural reasons. And also a big thing as well, which I think we, we might touch on later, is looking at a how the curriculum, alignment with the curriculum, how feasible it is to integrate such experiences into existing curriculum, how exam oriented um, a system is, for example, might mean that actually integrating EOC can be more challenging if you have a big leaving cert <laughs> stuck at, at the end of of the, the experience. What does it mean then? So if we say engaging in EOC, where are you going? So I suppose there's, it can be quite big or it can be quite, quite small. So we have, you know, you have at the, the big extreme, you've, you know, we all probably remember the days all off on a bus, a two hour journey off somewhere. Um, great adventure, great fun, like we might go to like a science museum, you could go up to the zoo or to an aquarium or to, to farms. But you can also think more locally and you could think about places within the locality that you could go to. You might be able to walk if you're in inner city school or with transport. So it could be libraries, it could be local museums, um, gardens, parks, farms, local lakes, for example. But the other one, and this for us is an area that we would probably be quite passionate about, is that it can also be around the school. It doesn't have to be this expensive place that you have to go to, that you have to get on the bus um, to go and engage in. So, and that's why I said outside, the outside of the classroom, not necessarily outside of the school. So it could be within the school grounds, um, I know a lot of schools now are building outdoor classrooms, they might do gardening in the school, they might you know, have set up uh, weather stations in, in the school, um, or, or local, as we say, local forests or parks that you can, you can engage in that are close by. So you, and that's what we would have pushed throughout this project, to consider sustainable engagement um, that is helpful for the environment or doesn't damage the environment, but also can be sustained by the school because it doesn't cost money and it's also easier to do and it can be integrated more into the, the teaching and learning experience. <laughs> um, so one, there was a couple of aspects of the project that we were responsible for and I'll talk a little bit more about the project in a minute. But we did, we had to do a systematic literature review on EOC um, experiences. Um, so would have drawn maybe, I think it was like 50, by the time we filtered down through the PRISMA process, we ended up with about 50 research articles. And just to show, I suppose, that the benefits of EOC are evidenced within the literature. We, the, the research tells us that it impacts on students learning, so they cognitively um, can learn content knowledge um, through the experience, but it also has a big impact on more um, non-behavioral or effective domains. So motivation, interest, enjoyment, communication skills, social skills, etc., etc. Um, I'm trying to think, was there something else? Give me one second, sorry. I feel like there was something else I wanted to say that Yes, the challenges, because we don't have it up on the slide. There are, of course, challenges, and I think a lot of the challenges would be the expense. Um, and a number of the schools that we would have in, been involved in were DESH schools. So, you know, paying for additional costs of buses, for example, on top of additional costs of schooling is, is just too much. Um, and then alignment again, as I said, with existing curriculum, particularly at second level, teachers can find it quite restrictive to find the time and the space to actually engage with these types of um, initiatives.
And there are eight, eight partners across, I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries. Um, so we have Gennardo, who are the lead from Hungary. You have ESF, who are um, from France. The University of Groningen from um, the Netherlands. Us, you have Bridge Budapest Learning School from Finland. The Big, Big Van, who are from Spain. And Cardes, who are from Cyprus. Um, so most of those by the two universities are businesses and companies who are set up to engage in educational activities and who would have very strong links with schools, um, maybe less experience with research, um, which we might talk about later. So ultimately, I suppose across this, there's these partners, but these are the partners that are case study sites. So there's four um, partners who implemented EOC with primary and post-primary schools, um, eva researched, evaluated, eva and evaluated it. Um, okay. Um, and there was a mix across, we all got kind of different age groups as well um, across, um, across the different partners. And then, um, and like Elaine said at the start, what is it trying to do? So it's trying to the project is trying to increase interest in science, but also increase scientific knowledge and transferable skills, particularly around sustainability and plastic use. So it's a very strong link with um, sustainable, sustainable development um, goals. So what, during the, the systematic literature review, I suppose we would have looked at the models of EOC, how was it conducted, what like what's effective practice with, within it. And drawing on that, um, a number of the partners would have developed uh, a model to, to frame the EOC experience. Um, and I suppose this is what it was a, a five step um, model. So the first one being prepare. So it's around the planning, choosing the site, but also planning, identifying what sustainable development goal we would be focusing on, how would it link with the curriculum, what is it that we would be, um, be, be looking at? And that could, uh, oftentimes the teacher was leading that, but it could involve the students um, as well. What we found from the systematic review is that it's not just about getting on the bus, everyone, off we go. It's really important that the pre and the post learning take place so that the learning that you're engaged in in the experience is grounded within classroom learning and grounded within the curriculum. So there would have been a strong focus here on, on ensuring that support in it. So orientate, there would have been a bit of time spent, like where are we going, what do we think we might see there, what type of questions might we ask, what type of data what might we collect while we're there. And I suppose the balance in that was that you don't want to take the surprise and the fun away from it, but you still need to have the students prepared before they, they go out. Discover is where they went out on the site, um, and so they engaged in real life activities. And the plan as well was that these would be student centred. So it's not just about going out and listening to a lecture somewhere, but that they'd actually be doing something and collecting a data. The also plan as well is that there would be some action from it. So the students were asked and supported and encouraged to, to carry out a youth initiative. And Deirdre will talk about some examples of what that might be. So it could be anything, but it would be an action as a result of what they've experienced and the data that they've collected. Um, you know, so I suppose we wanted to make them see that they could actually, they weren't passive in this, this process. And then finally, reflect, and that's the post-learning. So what was learned, why was it important, connect to real life, and what, what would we go, and what, what next? And thanks to Deirdre, with her work with the teachers, they were supported in doing that. But again, it wasn't just about going to the, out into the EOC experience. With the planning, the teachers had to consider what 21st century competencies can they support and integrate? And that was based on a particular framework. So looking at ways of thinking, ways of working, et cetera, et cetera. 
what sustainable development goals are they going to be looking at throughout the, the EOC experience? And we also, another thing that we led in the project was the gender strategy. And a lot of the time these are written and kind of put to the side, whereas we wanted to make sure the gender strategy that was inclusive of all uh, and written in a very inclusive way that that was lived through the project as well. So the teachers were encouraged to identify aspects of inclusion and diversity that could be supported through it. And ultimately what they were given was like, um, like an Excel sheet with bits and they could pick and choose from it. So there was a good frame for them in terms of each of, each of these. We did have a copy of that, but we took it out, I think, in this, in this version. But hopefully that's, that's clear. So I'm going to hand over to Deirdre and then I'll come back in with the impact. Um, so I get the fun part, I get to talk about case studies and how this played out in the classroom. Um, so the age groups we covered was from age 6 to 18 across the four different countries. Ireland had age 6 to 8 and age 16 to 18, so we were at the two different spectrums, so we had very different experiences. And we chose the primary school example just for this presentation because it showed how it went across every single subject in the class. The, the teachers decided to take this on for the entire term, so that wasn't planned. We just wanted them to take this on and do a little, a few activities here and there and trial it, but they said we can see how this goes across the whole curriculum in a wide variety of subjects, so this is actually how we're going to teach for the rest of the term. So we approached the sixth class teacher until we realised the age groups were changed and it was six to eight. So then the second class teacher came on board and they decided they were going to do a buddy system. So that was kind of another adaptation that the Irish case study took on. So Orla talked about the learning objectives and it was at the planning phase that the two teachers realised that this actually spans all our curricula in seven different areas. So the 21st century skills were the ways of thinking, ways of working, tools for working and living in the world. Um, and the teachers saw creativity and innovation, we can bring them out, we can get them to create models, and um, their critical thinking when they're trying to solve problems out on, out on site. Um, they looked at their personal and social responsibility in terms of their youth initiatives. Um, in inclusion and diversity, they were very focused on this because their particular school wanted to focus on inclusion and diversity, so they said we're going to really put a strong emphasis on especially disability. Um, and how they can include disability into um, their Otter Lab. And then the sustainable development goals they focused on was gender equality, clean water, sanitation, climate action, and life below water. So I'll give you an idea of how this played out in the school. So really, this school's focus was on peer-to-peer -peer learning and mentoring. So we had a second-class student paired with a sixth-class student all of the time for all of the activities. Um, their task was to collect evidence out on site. So when they did the pre-learning, they then had to go out to site and collect evidence. That could be observations, it could be drawings, it could be physical leaves. They were collecting leaves and bringing them back to the lab in UL and looking at them under microscopes. Connecting with the community was another focus for them. One of the second class students' grandfather um, actually swam, I'll show you the focus of this in a minute, but the Corbally Baths was the focus of when they were closed down. So their grandfather used to swim in the Corbally Baths before they were shut down. So the school thought that this would be a perfect topic or a big idea to center the Otter Labs around um, and reducing plastic waste. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So their in-class activities had lots of cross curricular links. They were able to link it to SDSE, science, SESE, history, geography, maths, primary language, and visual arts. Now that's one slide there, but what that looked like was the teachers came into the school, we printed out the curriculum for each of them, and they started mapping the le Otter Lab learning obje objectives to every single objective in each one of those curricula. It was a huge amount of work. It, we didn't just kind of see it was gonna happen at all, but they were so engaged, and they could really see the link with what was already happening that they voluntarily did it, I don't know why, <laughs> but they, they really saw that, you know, this is how they can consolidate 21st century skills and sustainable development goals across all the subjects and show um, a sequence of learning. Um, so they did lots of mini EOCs during the year, and I suppose one thing that might not have been clear from the Otter Lab cycle was that discover phase happens a few times. 
So it's not just one site visit. It can be happening several times throughout. I talk about three big instances that this school did, but they were constantly going out to visit their school ponds, or they were going out to their school garden. They were um, planting berries and picking berries, and they were also like doing measurements out in their school garden. So that was happening all of the time. They didn't even consider that to be EOC, even though it was happening and embedded in their learning. So their first visit was to UL, conveniently enough. Um, we brought the second and sixth class um, to the FSPC where they carried out three workshops in rotation. So we had three groups of students, second and sixth class paired up. The first workshop, you'll see them up here, was Meet the Scientists, where they met two postgraduate students who talked about how they, were, how they got into science. And really the key focus here was belonging. So we're really trying to focus on, well, what did you do when you were their age? And now, how, what are you doing in work? And break it down into something that was, that was relatable. So are you part of the hockey team? Do you do gymnastics? Okay, so there was one of the postgraduates, he was gymnastic, he did gymnastics in UL, the other girl was on the Irish hockey team. This was amazing for them, they could see the relatability of it. Then they also collected things on their trip. So I forgot to mention the sixth class actually cycled um, to UL because they wanted to be more sustainable, but unfortunately the second class were too small. So um, the sixth class cycled, but the second class got the bus. So that was exciting for them. Their next thing was um, a walk around campus to look at water and different types of water. So water used for recreation, water um, used for drinking or eating, water used in the rivers, because swimming was kind of a focus for them. And then they looked at the different structures like the living bridge and how, how these things are built around water in their life. So it was really focused about water in their life. And then you can see, um, this was the sixth class cycling. Their second visit then was to the Corbally Baths. So the idea here was first they learned about water, things that were in water, bacteria, etc. And now they were going to actually investigate water in their area. So the Corbally Baths was their focus where they visited the Corbley Baths, and you can see them here, they're taking water samples. Um, this is a lovely picture of the mentoring going on. One of the interviews talk about, it was so frustrating. I had two students to mind, and one was going ahead, and one was lagging behind, and I couldn't mind the two of them at the same time. So uh, the responsibility and the social responsibility of the sixth class was lovely to see coming out in the interviews as well. Um, so they were collecting water samples, and then the third visit was back to the site, but this was with the grandfather where they um, were measuring actually what the depth of the Corbley baths were. It was supposed to be two metres, and then when they measured it, it was one metre. The students learned that it's all the silt and all the changing rooms that were emptied into the water baths. So then the natural tide doesn't actually clean out the Corbley baths. So it was kind of a historical, they were linking it to an old photograph. So you see the students up there, that's an old photograph of, and um, they were reinventing a photograph of swimmers on the bridge um, when they were there, so they looked at the old photographs, they drew pictures. Um, and then they started their youth initiative. So you can see their youth initiative on this side, the six to eight years old, um, did a Bring Back Corbally Baths social media campaign, where they made models um, of the baths, they drew images of how they could reinvent the baths, talking about different access points for people with disabilities, so that's how they were bringing in the inclusion and diversity. Um, and then they did hashtags, so different hashtags, and tried to promote them in the social media. So that was their youth initiative. I also included the youth initiative for the other two schools, um, because second level was something that we were a bit worried about in terms of time restraints, and we expected that it would be all transition year groups that we'd be handled. But we weren't. We had a fifth year chemistry class who did biochemical <coughs> oxygen demand, and they did site visits to Bunnicky Wastewater Treatment Plant, and they also paired up with the primary school and went back and taught them um, about water treatment. So it linked in nicely with their uh, sustainable development goals. And that wasn't something we foresaw either. It just kind of happened as a progress. So that collaboration between teachers within the school and then outside the school was lovely. Um, and then this was a transition year uh, group, but the interesting thing about this group is they don't have physics in their school, but they decided to focus on a physics topic. So they decided that energy was really important in their school because of the curriculars that are coming on, on to try and upgrade schools. 
and the students want to be a part of making energy changes. So they were suggesting things like putting graphics leaders on the doors, and they had equipment like laser cameras where they could see where heat loss was happening. And these students didn't have physics at all, like a very low amount of physics. Also a desk school, so resources was really important. So all of these schools were supported with time, I suppose, for planning, resources for carrying out the activities, buses, as Orla mentioned, transportation, um, and that really encouraged them, but most of all they had the support of their school. So senior management, especially in the primary school, said, you know, I trust you, you know, design it the way you think, the same with the fifth year chemistry. Um, secondary school was that little bit more challenging, but the teachers were very, felt like it mattered, so they were, they were going to embed it into it as much as they could. Um, so on the research side of things, I suppose we had to carry out research side by side with this and assess the EOC experience. We carried out pre and post student surveys, um, teacher interviews and student focus groups, and then student artifacts was a huge part of the data collection. So whatever the students and teachers were doing as they were um, carrying out the Otter Labs, that was going to form part of their data collection. Um, so this looks quite complex for our assessment and implementation plan. Also, we were probably a little bit optimistic in what we were going to get here. Um, well, we started with some teacher training and supporting the teachers in the planning. Um, then we worked with the teachers on creating the Otter Labs and aligning it with the curriculum, so the objectives aligning it with the curriculum and teacher plans. Um, in the orientate stage, we asked teachers to um, complete a survey with their students. And then within the discover stage, it was really exit tickets. So you know, teachers were already kind of doing that and assessing student learning. So we just asked if we could collect those. Um, we gave suggestions of exit tickets. Uh, some of them used them, some of them used their own artifacts. It, it varied. Um, student worksheets then, when they were doing their youth initiatives, and classroom artifacts, I said, was a huge part of the data collection. So the youth initiatives, the PowerPoints, um, the social media <coughs> tags, trying to collate all of that. So we're in the process of analysing that. <laughs> Good fun. And then we did post Otter Lab uh, focus groups. And what's important here is this was carried out across four countries, four different curricula, four different age groups. So we really had to try and think of an assessment implementation plan that could move and be flexible across all of those um, and also the labs had to be flexible so we were lucky in that all of our schools did more than one trip outside the classroom because the literature was showing that that's where the most benefits come from but some of the other countries could only do one one trip and that was as much as they could do so um, we're still processing that to see if it has a big impact on us back to you Ola. We might stay up because we can do this. Yeah, the part okay. that Gina wants to do, so we might do this together. Thanks. Um, so, given given the the title of the session on um, research with impact, we, we said we give some focus to this, but it is, as you just said, we're they're still still analysing the the data. Um, so we'll we'll talk to that. So I suppose there's. Some that are like I suppose not necessarily research led, but still we can see that the impact. So even something as simple as the, the school getting resources, um, and the school would have picked resources that they felt they would use a, a number of times, that a number of class groups would benefit from, and also we would have encouraged them to get something that was sustainable, so not something that would be used once and thrown away. Um, can you remind me where there's some things that what was the there was one thing they were gonna buy that was um you, you could only be used once, wasn't there? Oh yeah, and some of the kits, so some water testing kits in one of the particular ones, they were looking at water te water testing, in particular the fifth year group. Um but the school decided they were going to do a no plastic policy. So when we're talking about the focus on no plastic and environmental sustainability, they wanted no plastic. So what, when you kind of remind them of what they were focusing on, they said, oh yeah, well we have glass where we could do that. So they kind of pivoted and said, okay, we could actually do a digital, uh, digital uh, instrumentation to measure that we could use over and over. So it was just getting them, you know, more than what we were talking about, the catering, it's just getting them to think about that and think about what was the focus and how you can approach it in a more sustainable way. 
And then collaboration. So there would have been collaboration within schools. So we had a second and a sixth year teacher and the students linking up, but also there was two schools that came together. There was also the collaboration between, particularly between Deirdre and the, the teachers, um, for example, and Deirdre still getting text messages off <laughs> one of the teachers telling her all the things that she's doing and all the great work. So there's definitely good, good relationships there. There is, uh, I suppose, a lot of the time with these projects, you have to have a website, and th there was an international hub set up that um, it's a site for teachers, and, well, educators in general, that they can, they can come and share resources. So there is, there's a number of Irish stakeholders on that, and it is an international hub that runs events um, for, for teachers. Um, yeah, I think the other thing there as well is collaboration within the university. Like we were mm -hmm. very lucky, we were able to work with SSPC, we were able to work with the physics department and bring students in, mm -hmm. and having that accessibility for students was so important. Um, and then, there's another one there, I can't remember. Well, it'll first. come back. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to take and leave this one? Because yeah, some okay. Of this, um, so some of the data. So some of the data, we just took a quick look for this, but yeah. we're in the middle of analysing it. So. Um, this is the Ireland case study, and I suppose we took a teacher quote and a student quote. In Ireland in particular, um, looking at the school that I showed you as the case study, it was really focused on the accessibility of science. So teachers really felt that education outside the classroom supported the accessibility of science towards their students um, and gave them an idea to kind of uh, see that science is something as exciting. Um, and then you can see students there. My favourite place was the Corbally Baths because it was a nice adventure. And it was one of my first times there, even though it was only five minutes down the road. So exposing them to their community was very important. Um, they also felt that the, their confidence and their social awareness was, was increased. And I got that time and time again with this school. They, were, they couldn't believe the students that came out of their shell when they engaged in these type of activities. And there was also an instance in the one of the... Um, post-primary schools, something similar, that they actually pulled a student from another class because this project was taking place and said, from one chemistry class to the other chemistry class, so that their experience of school could be a little bit brighter because they were having a tough time. So that, that was, like, that's anecdotal at the moment, but we're seeing that across um, the other schools. And then, um, yeah, this was a nice one from a student about, like, this is a primary school student who talks about drawing to scale and things being bigger and smaller. So, you know, they're so young, but they're still thinking about proportion, you know, scale. When they're drawing the pools, they can't draw the person smaller than the pool, or bigger than the pool, because it doesn't make sense. So it, we're looking into their their knowledge, I suppose, being infamous as well. And just again, because I know that, like, the kids, to go back to what you just said, that the, the kids that maybe didn't view themselves good in the subjects began to feel that they could they could achieve within so the subject. It was quite interesting to see some of the quotes from the teachers where they say they're actually seeing students planning by themselves um, and they're not just listening to the teacher and this was an excellent almost every outdoor project is learning by doing so they were really focused on the student-centered aspect of it and you can see that with the students that we didn't have to sit in our own seats we were outside the classroom we were working outdoors so we we're a little uh, few other impacts with links with international partners that will continue on for future projects. There are, with everything, there's a number of publications that will come for this, whatever impact that will have, was, as always, who knows. Um, and there are a number of, of conference presentations. And one of the big impacts that we're currently working on is that we're, we have to develop an accreditation model for this, to, for an EU, a European accreditation model, so that future educators who want to um, embed EOC um, how they could then accredit it. Now that's difficult because um, we're still unsure who's going to be doing the accrediting. It has to be loose enough that it can be, it can adapt to, to systems, but yet it will be a support and a guide so that people will know what to implement, you know, that they can adopt the philosophy of EOC um, as well as the, the, the approach. Yeah, and I think to sum up, like the literature is showing us that pedagogical models being defined in the literature in terms of these type of projects is often not there. So really focusing on a pedagogical model, focusing on a structure and I suppose instructional approaches to education outside the classroom. So it's not that one-off trip that students remember as, oh, I forgot my lunch on that trip, but there is no actual learning. So trying to embed the process 
as part of classroom practice where teachers don't say, we go to the site and then we come back to the classroom and we reteach it. It's part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the most important thing we were saying to teachers, especially at the post-primary. I said, what are you already teaching? Like, what's on your schema work? They already have the plans laid out. What are you already teaching? And how can we embed Otter into that? So, you know, it was already part of their plan, but they just approached it in a different way to embed it in their teaching. And I, I think we've spoken to a lot of this already, but there's one other point, I think, which is what we struggled with a bit in the project, which was around researching the EOC experience and the difference between teachers engaging in it and it being a pedagogical experience versus then the need to get data on it. And it, it was difficult, um, which is problematic, but it is, it's just a, a tension, I think. Yeah, and I think we mentioned there also assessment literacy down at the bottom. like. I think the teachers don't realise what can be assessment when they're carrying it out. So often we ask teachers, you know, how did you assess the learning? You know, did you carry out an exit ticket? Did you ask questions? Oh no, we just, we didn't assess, you know, we just observed students and we're like, well, that's assessment, you know, and, and how did you assess and how did you know whether students were, you know, attaining skills or, you know, what, what aspects were they um, thriving in and that. So, that's something we're kind of investigating at the moment. You know, is there data there that teachers don't realise is data? So it's worth acknowledging that as well. Okay, and that's it. Yeah.